All right. So anyway, Jens Thomason, uh, thank you so much for joining the Number Perspectives podcast. Such Thanks a pleasure to have you on. Look, we're going to talk about uh, the changing relationship between the Nordics and Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to talk a little bit about what it means for trade, business, investment, all of these things. We know the world is changing. We know that has implications for Africa. But before we do that, uh, why don't you give us a bit of background on yourself, your work, your partner with AP Miller Capital. Uh, you know, what do you do basically? Where does Africa fit into the picture for you? So we, we set up uh, AP Model Capital back in, in 2017 to focus on initially uh, infrastructure and high growth markets. And, and Africa was our first port of call for, for three reasons. Um, one was the opportunity set. Uh, the MERS group has historically done, done well in Africa. Uh, we have some strong tailwinds, demographics, generally high economic growth. And it also coincided with uh, with the refugee crisis, so it was very sort of apparent what 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 the the risk was if we did not develop uh, Africa as a continent. So, <clears throat> so that um, that allowed us to 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 raise our first fund, which was about a billion dollars, um, which we invested across eight investments over three years during COVID, covering transport, energy across the continent. So, so some examples we run. A ports uh, consortium together with Africa Finance Corporation and Olam, which exports 15% of global manganese production, about 13% of global cocoa production out of Arabic Coast. Uh, we run, uh, invested in a company called Aerono together with um, with IFU, DEG, uh, local pension funds, and emerging capital partners, which. Uh, since we sort of committed to investment has uh, doubled its um, installed capacity on the power generation side. We now produce about 60, 65% of all power produced in our coast. Wow. We've uh, doubled the number of electricity connections. We've do increased water connections by about 60%. Uh, we have um, and reduced carbon intensity by 26%. Right. So um, we also more recently acquired a company called Vector Logistics out of the RCL group in South Africa. Uh, it's a company we've known from sort of the Maersk legacy for, for a long time. Uh, it is the market leader on distribution storage of frozen food, primarily chicken, in, in South Africa. So cold chain logistics is, uh, is a, quite an interesting theme for us, um, about 25% of all food goes to waste across the African continent because of poor storage conditions. Mm -hmm. So um so um so that's that was sort of the starting starting journey. We 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 since sort of moved on with uh, with uh, with fund number two which also brought us into India, Southeast Asia, but uh, Africa is probably I would say two thirds, three quarters of uh, of our investment focus mm -hmm. to date. Did you do much Africa before AP Miller Capital or <coughs> was was that a new experience for you? Um so so I I was shipped down in my early days. Uh, I was in the M&A team for B BHP mm -hmm. when Black economic empowerment was introduced in the mining sector, and right. uh, that was back in 2003, I believe. We thought we were being nationalized, so that was a crash course into, into Africa. Um, <laughs> I then uh, worked a little bit on the M&A side on, on diamond prospecting, uh, including some M&A prospects, uh, Greenfield. So I started looking at Africa already in 2000 and 2003, okay. had a little bit of emerging markets uh, experience before that um, on, on the power side with, uh, with Enron and also BP. Um, but uh, more recently, uh, I was with uh, with Denim Capital, um, which came out of horror management, and and that brought me back into sort of power development on on the African continent in South Africa, Ghana, Guinea, and and, and a few other places. Okay, so we're talking uh, more than twenty years now o overall. I mean, on, on and off, yes. Yeah, yeah. So starting to show my age, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and clearly, from just the the kind of snapshot you've given us of what AP Miller Capital does, quite a broad brief different yeah. sectors, different parts of the continent. So uh, work a lot with the Nordics, obviously, but yeah. also with local partners. So I think it's fair to say, probably got a good idea of what's happening investment wise on the continent. It's safe to say it's an exciting time for Africa at the moment without being naive about it. Uh, we, we know that <laughs> the world is changing, it's changing fast. There's a lot of talk that Africa is becoming more important, more significant from an investment standpoint. Do you think that's overblown or is, is that a legitimate argument? No, look, I, I, I think it is a very interesting time. There are opportunities and there are challenges, of course. Um, I think the opportunities lie in uh, the change in geopolitics as a key driver. Um, China has been a big uh, investor in Africa for some time. They're now seeing increased competition from India, from uh, the GCC region. Russia is playing its own little, little sort of playbook. Um, and. I think Europe and, and North America are, are waking up to the fact that Africa is 
home to about 40% of undeveloped arable land, undeveloped mineral resources, at a time when access to critical minerals, and we're seeing basically uh, the grades of operating mines in OECD countries declining, which puts an emphasis on, on new exploration. So, so I think that there is um, there are a lot of good reasons for engaging in Africa. Uh, near shoring, French shoring, we've seen a strong increase in the car manufacturing industry in places like Morocco. Um, obviously, uh, South Africa has been a large manufacturing hub for for Mercedes Benz, BMW for quite some time. So, so there, there are there are some real um, opportunities there. I think the the other trend which we shouldn't underestimate, even though it's more medium term, is um, Africa will probably be the only continent with a rising population in ten years time. Um, uh, Japan's population is declining by 5% every decade, uh, Europe's population is declining and with Africa probably close to doubling its population in the next 30 years, that will have an impact. Uh, exactly how that will play out is, is too early to say, but there is an opportunity there to build a middle class, an opportunity to build industries, create jobs, uh, create economic wealth, uh, but, um, but it's also been a challenging last 18 months for Africa with, I said, about eight countries having had a change of government without an election, so to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and we know that finances are difficult at the moment for many yes. governments as well. We know that uh, the debt burden is a problem, so we're not going to sugarcoat it, you know. It's, it's Of course, it's a, it's a <coughs> complex place, it's a difficult place. But I, I, picking up on the point that you made around the opportunities of geopolitics, some people might think, hang on, isn't the geopolitics bad behind this? Uh, you, we look at the world and we, for, you know, for reasons we don't need to get into, there's, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned right now. Uh, a yeah. lot of people are very anxious. And of course, you know, we're not going to pretend that there aren't very significant risks. Why is it an opportunity for Africa? It's, uh, I mean, as, as you mentioned, you've seen trade barriers being erected. Um, and and um, of course, Europe is in a particular uh, sensitive state if you look at uh, trade is basically linked to China, security linked to the US and uh, energy linked to Russia. Yeah. Uh, and of course the European Union has come a long way in trying to sort of become less reliant on, on certainly energy from, from, from Russia and China's, uh, Chinese goods is, is omnipresent. Um, so if you're looking to create independence then, then Africa has a, an, a good opportunity to become a new source for raw materials, but also more importantly, a new source of uh, of, of manufacturing. So we we are, um, as an example, on something that's very early stage. We're working together with um, Total Energies and, and CIP to develop a green ammonia project in Morocco, which has some of the best wind and solar resources in the world, and happens to be eight miles away from from southern Spain. So so uh, when the uh, uh, the stars will uh, align, that, that can be a very good source for the energy transition and Africa can play an active, active role because we simply don't have the space in and the land in Europe to build renewable projects of that scale to build that kind of, uh, kind of fuel. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you used the phrase earlier that Europe is kind of waking up to the opportunity. Uh, part of that of course is just, well, what's there in terms of uh, potential for energy and energy security, yeah. food production, food security. I mean, the, the demographics you've touched on, you know, if you want future markets, well, look no further uh, than Africa. How much of it of that waking up do you think is also the increased competition that we're seeing from other parts of the world? You mentioned, we all know China is a yeah. big investor, but the GCC uh, countries, they're, they're seriously ramping up. India, of course, Japan, and m many other places. How much does that play into this picture? I mean, it's difficult to say whether that has sort of sparked uh, activities from, from, from European companies and, and European Union, but, but um, you have the GCC region recognizing they're coming to the end of oil um, and, and starting to build the version 2.0 of their economy. That requires raw materials and, and Africa is, is close proximity. Uh, India is going through a phenomenal ec economic growth, uh, clearly benefiting from the geopolitical tensions in, in, in the world seen as a fairly neutral hub for, for all, how would say, all, um, all parties in, in, this, in, in this sort of deglobalizing world. Uh, and again, Indian conglomerates are now looking to Africa for basically integrating the supply chains. So, so um, now the, on, on the positive side, if you look at, at Norway, where, where I'm from, where we're sitting, I mean, Norway was a very poor country 150 years ago, but built its wealth on transport, shipping, uh, energy, aluminium, uh, energy, oil and gas, and now more recently, 
uh, proteins, aka fish farming. Yeah. All industries which have a very strong link to uh, to the opportunities on the African continent. Yeah. So so I think I think there is um, strong increased desire. There are companies here with the risk appetite to go into new markets, um, and of course there are lessons learned there, and there are certain things to be mindful of. But but uh, the competencies is there. The, uh, the intent is could, could be there and, and mm-hmm. uh, companies like Equinor now back in Tanzania. Yara is a big player in across the continent uh, with being probably second to OCP, the largest uh, seller of fertilizer. Yeah. So, so there are many, many good examples and, and how that can sort of come to, together. Is it happening fast enough? Clearly not. Is it are there things we can do to accelerate that maybe? And, and uh, of course, we try to be a, be a conduit in that conversation as well. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that a bit more, you know. So like, how do we accelerate? How do we, how do we catalyze? And maybe we take a step back before we you know, get into the nitty gritty of it. One of the, the, the issues, the debates that's going on is that, you know, look, if you want to work with Africa in the 21st century going forward, given that the world <coughs> is changing, you also kind of have to change your attitude towards this place. Uh, and we, you know, those who know the continent will understand what that means. Mm. You know, there, there's been, let's say, a history of maybe top-down approach of uh, maybe not doing as much listening as, as you should yeah. be doing, maybe not understa- uh, putting enough effort into understanding this place. Put differently, there's a lot more talk about partnership these days. What's your take on this? And and is there a need for a, a new approach, or you know, is is business as usual done when it comes to Africa? Look, I, I think understanding the uh, environment you operate in is is critical, um, and is in, in 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 most developing markets access to quality and information uh, is is difficult. And, and because you're dealing in more opaque markets. So that requires more boots on the ground, more presence, and, and to your point, um, partners, but the right partners. Uh, we, we typically seek local joint venture partners or we partner with local teams on, on the ground. Um, and then, of course, we then uh, translate in uh, the experience from, from, from our own experience. One, one of my partners used to run the MERS Group's uh, activities across the continent for 20 years. Um, he, he may be Danish, but he's 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 uh, probably met met most heads of state for the last twenty years right. across most countries, right. and and um, and has a very deep relationship with uh, family-owned companies that have been operating to uh, in a way that is you can work together with them as a sort of Danish, Norwegian, mm-hmm. or, or otherwise international company. Right now, on the point of more investment. I mean, mm-hmm. it's in a way we can't really have enough investment. I mean, it doesn't matter what you look at sector-wise. Uh, financing is an eternal challenge across the board. We need a lot more of it. Thankfully, there is more coming Africa's direction. Uh, is it fast mm-hmm. enough? Probably not. Now, in terms of a response from the Nordic region, particularly Norway, we are yeah. in Norway here, but also in, in countries like Denmark, what we've seen recently is uh, we've seen new strategies being launched by the governments. The Norwegian government has just put out a new strategy. The Danish government just a few months back put out a new strategy. And it's interesting to see the debate that's going on because clearly there's an understanding that while historically there has, of course, been a strong emphasis on, on uh, overseas development assistance and uh, you know sort of humanitarian issues, which nobody is ever going to suggest are not important. Of course, we now also live in an era where we need a lot more trade and we want a lot more investment yeah. in finance. What's your take on the, the, the policy shift that we're seeing in, in places like Norway and Denmark? Um, you know, encouraging? Um, would you like to see more? Where, where do you see some of the opportunities? Look, I'll, I'll, say, uh, I'll say the Danish uh, foreign ministry has always been very, very good at supporting business uh, businesses expanding into the countries where they they have their embassy. So 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 I think that that's probably a very good uh, example to follow. To follow. Um, I think it, it is very important to focus on that you're doing business and, and basically commercially rational business. Um, uh, the aid component is critical mm-hmm. if there and, and and as you said humanitarian aid and and and, and governance uh, is is very important. But ultimately you've got to create sustainable businesses. And, and to your point, I mean, yes, in theory, you could use endless amounts of capital, but uh, we are in a capital constrained environment. Uh, we've gone through probably the, the, the worst fundraising environment 
ever since private equity was established as a as a fund class, and emerging markets in particular Africa has been disproportionately hit in in, in, in that sense. So so capital is scarce; it's got to be used with caution and or and and, and optimized where you get the biggest impact, not only financially but also from from an impact perspective. We 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 track and have impact targets in our funds in addition to financial objectives. Um, um, so I would say um, uh, what, uh, what what could governments do? I mean, I think one is the the amount of capital available. The other one is to, I would say, um, uh, reduce the friction of, of unlocking that, that capital. And uh, uh, there are many development finance institutions in the world, some, some are more better than others we we work with some that i think are working working very well but but easing the access to to these pools of capital for entrepreneurs and neighbors yeah. so that you don't spend two-thirds of your time raising the capital at the expense of building the businesses yeah. they didn't want to do and part of that is i think what you touched on when you said that denmark's always been quite good at supporting companies mm. that are looking to invest in in emerging markets and when you when you see some of the countries that are experiencing quite a bit of success on the continent, that always <clears throat> appears to be a, a kind of key component of the strategy, that there's yeah. a, a good relationship or a strong relationship between the government and the companies. China is probably the most striking example yeah. of that, but it's not the only one, and it's not limited to China. Um, do you think that that's kind of understood sufficiently? Um, I mean, or, or how, how much can you really do uh, if, if, you're, if you aren't hands-on? Uh, let me put it that way, right? Like, how yeah. much uh, how much more do we need to see in terms of supporting companies to push them into emerging markets? Look, I, I, th I think um, it depends a little bit on which sector you're in as well. So, so one of the reasons, uh, so I'm, I came from the energy industry, moving into a fund that does mostly transport, and and one of the aspects that appealed to me there was that you could build business without relying on government fiscal support. Uh, if you look at the power industry, typically because of the setup of the power sectors in, in many countries in Africa, you basically require a long-term offtake agreement with a sovereign guarantee, which then basically ties up uh, a part of, of the government's balance sheet, so to speak. Um, on the transport side, I mean, our, our, our port in, in Gabon that exports 15% of global uh, manganese production, there is no government support. We built a, a greenfield port in San Pedro, the second port in Arbor Coast, again, no government support, purely based on commercial commercial customers. And, and I think that obviously has a much, is much easier to scale up in, in, a, in, a, in a country because you don't start tying up, to your point, limited fiscal resources at a point in time when debt levels are high, interest rates are high, and therefore the refinancing cost for for governments going out to the bond markets are are, are, are punitive. Mm -hmm. So so I think the the art is to find these industries where you can create clusters that then basically become um, how can I say uh, self fulfilling. So so uh, we have a, a business in South Africa that moved into to the power space by building basically commercial industrial power facilities. So we're we're building. I think we're the largest, one of the largest CNI producers in South Africa, and there's no government support. Uh, we're simply basically putting the rooftop solar, uh, rooftop solar panels and batteries on commercial uh, real estate that becomes our client. Yeah. And then, if they can't pay, we peel, peel, peel it down and move it somewhere else. As a, as a but it, that hasn't become become mm -hmm. a problem. So, so I think creating, and then of course um, we can now look at our own portfolio. We, we bought a, a vector logistics out of our sale foods here um, last year and, and um, one of the largest cost components is electricity because you've got to use that to freeze chicken. Um, and so, suddenly we have a company here that can start pitching for that. Yeah. Obviously they've got to be the lowest price and the best quality because it's a, it's a commercial, uh, uh, commercial deal between mm -hmm. two independent companies. but. Uh, now you're starting to build something that doesn't rely on an ESCOM offtake agreement and a South African Treasury guarantee. Uh, I like the picture you're painting because it, it captures some important elements about about this place called Africa. One is nuance, mm. right? It's it's. I know we say this all the time, but it's it's worth repeating. It's not a country. 
Uh, it's a very mm -hmm. diverse place. And I guess it also kind of underlines that if you know what you're doing, right, depending on what you're looking at, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Now, without sugarcoating things, you mentioned the debt, the, the fiscal challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, you've just said we've probably been through the most difficult fundraising period since private equity became became an industry. Um, hopefully that's cyclical. Hopefully, <laughs> you know, hopefully things will, will <clears throat> rebound. But Hey, let's let's look ahead a little bit. You know, let's, let's let's wrap up by just looking ahead a little bit. The next five, 10, 15 years or so. Um, how do you see this picture, um, you know, evolving to the extent that you want to start <laughs> predicting the future? We live in fairly unpredict unpredictable times, but there's some underlying big trends here that are that are, that are shaping Africa. You've already mentioned demographics, for example. Yeah. Like, like, what's your take on on where we go from here, and where do you see kind of the the, the reason for optimism? Um, it's very difficult to predict. I mean, if we if we sat there five years ago and <laughs> we tried to predict where the situation would be today, I mean, we, we clearly would have been wrong. We won't quote you on no. any of this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 uh, but I think um, uh, obviously looking at optionality, looking at downside risk mitigation, um, uh, thinking ahead of black swan events, uh, which seems to be beating statistical norms these days, uh, and that goes sort of. Uh, uh, across the world but but fundamentally uh, co core infrastructure focusing on, on on assets that have a strong protective competitive position in, in industry that will withstand the downturn is, is something we spend a lot of time looking at um, uh, as you, you mentioned demographics will be play a key key role um, uh, we have some some big events um, typically Tracking elections is something we, we always do because they are big events, not only in the US, but also in, uh, we have uh, Ivory Coast coming up next year. We'll see what happens there. We just came through one in South Africa, which I think we are, uh, I wouldn't call it a surprise, but quite pleased to see how a coalition government has created some stability in in, in, in a difficult no, place. I, I think a lot of people's um, minds have been put at ease a little bit because yes. you know, there were some concerns about that. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. No, and, and um, so, so, um, so um, but uh, I would say geopolitics going on will be a big, a big uh, driver in, in how and who will, will act and invest in, in, in Africa. Um, there is an opportunity, there's also a risk, uh, of course, and, and uh, but, but as I mentioned earlier on, we've seen uh, increased interest, certainly from uh, government institutions in, in North America and Europe to reactivate in Africa, yeah. uh, to create uh, uh, a path to independence on, on energy security, food security, and, and, and also trade. Yeah, and that's not a short-term thing, right? No. I mean, and I think that's an imp imp important yeah. dynamic to understand, that uh, a lot of the, the moves that we're seeing now and the investments that are being made, particularly in some of those sectors, energy and things like that, those are long-term yeah. uh, long things. So it's not like, we're, hopefully, we won't be here in five years and it'll all be over. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, we've got at least another 10, 15 years. Anyway, Jens, it's been, been, a, been such a pleasure. Thanks so Thank much you. for taking the time. Um, a lot more that we could get into, but unfortunately, we are out of time. Thanks so much, Jens. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan. <laughs>